Hello, my name is Michael Klems from Infobroker. Before we start with the keynote from Mary Ellen Bates at the Steilvorlagen 2019, I want to tell you something about this event during the Frankfurt Book Fair, which we established 2013 in Germany as the meeting point of the German information professionals. Steilvorlagen, which is a German word taken from the soccer language, was founded 2013 and established as a conference by Dr. Willy Bredemeyer. Willy Bredemeyer is the editor of the German journal Password Online, which is one of the important journals for information professionals in the German language area. The conference is hosted by the Frankfurt Book Fair and is a meeting point of information professionals in Germany and the neighbors Austria and Switzerland. The organization of the conference is done by a volunteer project group. Since 2014 I was in this project group with colleagues who are all working as information professionals or librarians. Since the first conference we documented the speeches by audio files as a podcast and started capturing with video. The complete speeches are free on YouTube or as podcast on the Infobroker podcast site. With this video I relaunched the international YouTube channel of Infobroker.de. Please subscribe the channel. I will be happy for comments and likes. It is worth because in December 2019 I will publish on this channel a long time video with Mary Ellen Bates about the role of information professionals in digitization. There will come more videos for searching in the online world at the end of this year and 2020. And now let's start the keynote of Mary Ellen Bates at the Frankfurt Book Fair in 2019 at the Steilvorlagen 2019. Please welcome now Ms. Mary Ellen Bates. Thank you very much. I have never been introduced in the same sentence as Robert Redford before, so <laughs> I, I feel like my life is complete, you know? <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And thank you so much for inviting me here. This is such an honor. Uh, to be to be at the at the book fair and to be able to talk about artificial intelligence. It's a strange topic, uh, strange new worlds and and new civilizations, perhaps. So I'll I'll try to make some sense out of how to think about uh, AI in the modern world. So here's this this happened about nine months ago, and this is when I knew that we were in trouble. I was at a conference. And uh, so I was, uh, I pulled up my phone and I put the hotel, uh, put the airport into Google Maps and just to see how long it would take to get to the airport. I just wanted to see whether, when I needed to call a taxi cab to get to the airport, will it take a half an hour, two hours, how long? So I put it in and, and I got this result. But as soon as Google showed me this result, a message popped up. There we go. It said, your flight is scheduled to depart on time. My How did Google know that I was interested in a flight? Well, I was going to the airport, I suppose. But your flight is scheduled to arrive on to depart on time, but due to a delayed incoming flight, there is a good chance that it will be delayed at least 30 minutes. Now, does, does anyone else think that's kind of creepy? It was, <laughs> how did Google know this? Okay, I use Google Mail, Gmail. And so Google knew my boarding information because of course I'd gotten my boarding pass had been emailed to me. And so in the time that it took for me to pull up Google Mail or Google Maps and look for the directions to the airport, behind the scenes, Google was saying, oh, look, it's Mary Ellen Bates. Let's go check her email and see what she's up to. Went into my email, noticed the flight was coming up, went to United Airlines' website to check to see the status of my flight, noticed that the flight was on time, but then checked to see where is that plane now? Is it on the ground yet? And was able to see that it was late and therefore I should probably accommodate that. All of that happened in this much time while I was getting directions to the airport. 
That's artificial intelligence, and it's right now in your phone. So that was when I realized that it's not AI isn't a future technology. It's today's technology. You have artificial intelligence in your pocket right now. So it's more of a matter of us understanding what that means to us as information professionals and how we can incorporate that into what we do. Okay. Here's, here's where <laughs> I thought Google Maps was scary. Here's what's even scarier, children. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. They're, they're talking about Generation Alpha. This is, this is the younger children, not Gen, Gen Y or Generation Z, but Generation Alpha, which I also call Generation AI. These are children who are growing up with robot toys as their peers. They have little fuzzy animals that interact with them and say hello to them and are friendly with them. And we're having some problems. Here we go. Here's, here's the thing that I found really interesting. There have been recent articles about how to raise children in the age of robotic toys. And parents are having to be taught how to refer, and they have to teach their children how to refer to these toys as it rather than he or she. There's such a tendency to personalize them. And of course, these toys are programmed to say, oh, hi, you're my friend, let's play, to be very interactive and friendly. And it's parents' jobs to teach those children that they are not your friend. These are toys, they are not your friend. Even though they're talking with you, interacting with you, responding to what you say, they're an it, not a he or she, and they're not your friend. This is a hard thing to teach a three-year-old when you think about it. That's a very sophisticated message. The thing that's so challenging is that these toys are, in a sense, smarter than the children are. They can talk to them, they can answer questions, they interact, they, they certainly seem to be coherent. The problem, the problem is getting the children to see them as a tool rather than a peer as a tool rather than a peer, and of course, we have to see that same thing. The exciting thing is that they've realized that children as young as four years old can learn how to program a robot. Now, one might think, why do you want a four-year-old to program a robot? I, I, I think about what I would be doing if I was four-year-old and had the power of a robot, but that's, a, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Here's the thing, they, they've, show, they've taught children how to teach robots how to play a game. So for example, they've, you know the game rock, paper, scissors? Rock, paper, scissors? Yes, all right. It's, it's a global game, it's so amazing. They, four-year-olds can teach a robot the rules to how to play, so they actually program these toys to play rock, scissors, paper with them. The, the epiphany comes when the children realize that while the robot may be able to beat them at the game, they may lose to the robot when they're playing rock, paper, scissors, but the children finally realize that while the robot could beat me at this game, I'm smarter than it is because I told it what to do. And that's a really important distinction there to see it's, it's not just what it's capable of doing, but it's only capable of doing that because I told it to. And that's where I think is really important is to get that distinction. Arthur C. Clarke, the great science fiction writer, one of his um, laws of technology was any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I sort of wonder what he would say today about artificial intelligence. It's even it's certainly indistinguishable from magic. But our challenge is how do we teach people when and how to trust artificial intelligence. It's ubiquitous, and it's becoming even more so in our day-to-day in, in our -day life, but when do we know when to be skeptical about it, and when should we just uh, learn to trust it? Oops. The cognitive revolution. This is where we run into problems. 70,000 years ago, Homo sapiens changed. They were a small group of people. They were, um, 
They, they originally went out of Africa and interacted with Neanderthals who beat them back, basically. And they were very, you know, it was, it was a small collection of these, these humans trying to make a, make a way in the world. 70,000 years ago, something happened, and all of a sudden, uh, humans, Homo sapiens, took over the world. They, um, the Neanderthals became extinct, and all of a sudden there was culture all around the world. What happened 70,000 years ago? Something happened different in our brains. Our brains were rewired. There was some kind of a, of a genetic mutation that turned us into the things that we are today. We were suddenly able to communicate abstract thought. And that was a remarkable thing, that we were able to pass on ideas instead of just where the berries are or who to look out for. Hmm, there we go. Importantly, we were able to gossip about other tribe members. Gossip is an original sign of intelligence. In, I know. <laughs> <laughs> You heard it here first. <laughs> no, but here's what's so important, is that gossiping about other tribe members enables us to evaluate whether other people are trustworthy. Until we can hear you tell me that so-and-so over there might not be honest, and you're telling me that that person over there is always trustworthy, even if I've never seen them before, then I learn who I can trust without having to interact with them directly. This enabled people to expand and to trust strangers because they had additional information. However, the thing to keep in mind is that this, this whole cognitive revolution, which enabled us to think differently and you know, become the world's most successful invasive species, which is what humans are, right? It assumes information equality. The whole thing about the effectiveness of gossip, the ability to talk about abstract thought, is that we assume that if I tell you something, you now know as much as I do, that we all pretty much know the same things, which, is, which for 70,000 years worked really well. And we were able to take over the world and become civilized as much as we are because of that. All of a sudden, technology has happened, and we have information inequality. As a result, there was, there were a, a, um, a study from a, it was a security company in the U.S., so they, you always have to look at who's doing the study and what they have at stake, and so it's a computer security company, but they found that 64% of organizations around the world have experienced a phishing attack in the last year. Phishing is when they email something in hoping to get people to uh, click on a link and then um, open up a virus into that organization's network, for example. 64%. Even worse, 77% of IT professionals who were surveyed said that they believe their firm is unprepared for today's cybersecurity challenges. Yeah, that... <laughs> This is, your security people are not feeling good about your security in your organization. That should make us all think twice, shouldn't it? But what this tells me is that we don't have information equality anymore, which means all of those skills that we've evolved for 70,000 years to know who to trust and why is no longer relevant because the assumptions aren't there anymore. Artificial intelligence is sometimes better than human intelligence in getting something done. The problem is, it's only better if a few conditions apply. First, is if that, that AI has been given enough historical data. This, see, this is where I think artificial intelligence is such an amazing thing for us as information professionals because it's based on information, lots and lots of information. That's all AI is dependent on, a steady source of reliable, good, unbiased, huh, relevant, I know, <laughs> therein lies the key, 
relevant, unbiased information in the past so that the AI system, whatever you're dealing with, has the same kind of an understanding of what hap what's the world like as we have. It also requires current information on whatever topic it's you know, doing, its, doing its work on. And finally, a good AI system relies on unbiased algorithms. And again, this is where the humans come in, is being able to figure out where, is our, where are our biases, where are the things that we are unquestioned assumptions, all those things that we haven't sufficiently examined. If we put those assumptions into an AI system, that's what we get back out again. It's no smarter than the information that we give it. I have an example here of when artificial intelligence isn't. Um, there's a, a data set called ImageNet. It's open source. It's a, collection, a huge collection of images, all of which have been meta-tagged with descriptions. The idea of this data set, ImageNet, is to enable someone who's building an AI system to have some information to feed it, to teach the AI about the world. Because remember, an artificial intelligence system is just sitting in a box. It doesn't know anything about the world besides what we tell it. And so this is a way of telling an AI algorithm about the world. All right, so there was a... Um, a, a um, Small demonstration, it, it stopped, it ended about two weeks ago, which is so sad. Um, it was called ImageNet Roulette, and the idea was to show people the underlying biases in these data sets that are educating AI systems. So it let you put in, it let you upload an image, and then it would say this image or ones like it in ImageNet are viewed as this characteristic. So let me show you. I put in my face. I am registered as an old woman. So if you want to, I, I like to think of myself as the prototype for old woman. So if anyone thinks old woman, obviously they're thinking of me. It was <laughs> sort of discouraging. Um, a friend of mine, Mary D. Ojala, put her face in there and it said she was the Dalai Lama. <laughs> <laughs> I put in a picture of Barack Obama and it called him a goofball, a buffoon, and a clown. I put in a picture of Donald Trump, I have to show this to you, and it labeled it as... <laughs> Maybe it's smarter than we think it is. <laughs> that I always wind up coming to Europe when America is doing something profoundly stupid and making us all look stupid. And so I'm always showing up saying, oh, yes, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky, or, <laughs> oh, Donald Trump. I always seem to wind up having to be there when we look like idiots. Anyway, so AI is sometimes smart, sometimes not, but it's basically, it's a toolbox. AI consists of a lot of different technologies which put together constitute artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence comprises computer vision, the thing that enables um, driverless cars to... There, there are towns in America that, that have driverless cars right now. It just, it's, it amazes me. It really, I'm not sure I feel comfortable about it, but it's weird. Facial recognition is AI technology. Speech recognition, which has been around. You think about that speech recognition. We forget there was a time when you couldn't talk into your phone and give it a command. Can you imagine that? There was a time when telephones had a cord attached to them, and the only thing that you, t when you talk to it, it would just like tell someone on the other end, but nothing else would happen. It's hard for us to remember that. Pattern recognition, which again, we've been seeing that for a long time. Machine translation, which every time I go outside the US, machine translation gets better, and it gets so much easier. The fact that you can now hold your f the camera on your phone, up to a sign in another language 
and it will translate that so that you see in the camera, you see the words in your language. That to me is freaking magic, it really is. And that's artificial intelligence. Text and data mining, which has been around for a long time, and this is sort of ba the basis on which a lot of AI is, is based on. And we've got a sad little machine here. There we go, robotics. Robotics is an, obviously another uh, big aspect of, our, of artificial intelligence. But then the thing that I think is most remarkable is, is deep learning. There's machine learning, which is you feed an AI system enough data and then you tell it the rules about here's, here are all these pictures of cats. This is a cat, this is a cat, this is a cat, this is a cat. Now, we'll show you another picture. Is this a cat? And with enough training, an artificial intelligence system can figure that out, just like an 18-month-old child. Deep learning is much stranger than that. The way deep learning works is you can't, and, and one example of this was an AI system was given a set of data and not told what it was and we let the AI system make its own interpretation about the world. This is so strange. So a, an AI system was given this huge data set of images. No metadata, just sort of like, you know, taking a child and letting them just absorb everything that they see without interpretation, not saying, this is a watch, this is a little black box, this is water, this is a glass. Nothing, just, just showing them images and saying to the AI, just organize it however you want to, just make sense out of it. Then they showed it an image of a cat and said, this is a cat. Can you find other cats? Then the AI system looked, had, had its own internal way of organizing those images and it was able to pull out other cat images. What's strange here is that we don't know how that AI had made sense of all the images. All we know is that if we tell it what a cat looks like, it's able to identify all the other cats in its database. That's deep learning. What's interesting about it is it's very powerful because it uses the power of, of automation to make connections that we might not be able to. The disadvantage is that nobody can explain it. We can't explain why that AI system was able to recognize this image as a cat. All we know is that it did and it was successful. That's a little bit worrisome. There we go. The fact that we don't know how it classifies things, we don't know whether it identifies the little ears, the little whiskers, the, the way that, we don't know. All we know is that it succeeded. That's deep learning. And boy, howdy, we're having some troubles here. Um, there we go. Okay, so how do we define AI, given that it's all kinds of things? My, my attempt at definition um, is that it's the, that, that area of computer science that focuses on enabling systems to mimic, to emulate cognitive functions normally associated with human beings. This isn't saying that it's thinking, it's just that it looks like it's thinking. Whether you want to define that as thinking or merely calculation, or whether maybe thinking is just calculation. I think it's important to distinguish that AI is emulating what, what humans do. When we keep that in mind, then we don't quite get quite as confused about the difference between human ability to recognize, to trust, to understand, and a machine's ability to do the same thing. Okay. Artificial intelligence isn't thinking yet. <laughs> I guess. It, but the thing is, it appears to be because it can detect unexpected patterns. These are the kinds of things that we can't do. What AI can't do is to create something new. It can identify what's there, but it can't identify something new. It can we can design 
a new way to do something. AI can tell you how people do something, or the average way, or all the ways, or perhaps the most efficient way, but not a new way. We can question why. AI doesn't ask why. That's a human inquiry. And humans, as opposed to AI, can recognize an can respond to an unrecognized need. We can recognize, hey, wait a minute, there's a different way to do things. Maybe we could do things completely differently. What else AI can't do? AI can't empathize. And I, I say yet, because just like ImageNet is a data set of open source images that have been meta metadata tagged so that they can understand it, there is a data set of voices with various tones, an angry voice, a happy voice, a sad voice. And so all these different voices all have labels to them. And there are AI systems that are attempting to learn how to understand human tone based on this data set of emotions and to respond accordingly, to respond with an empathic voice, to respond with a calm voice, or to respond with an excited voice, if that's what's necessary. That, in fact, I noticed, maybe, I don't know how many of you rely on Google Maps for directions as much as I do. I could get lost anywhere. I could probably get lost in this room if you give me enough time. So getting from one place to the other, I always just, allowed extra time to get lost and then to find my way again. And that worked out fine until Google Maps came along and all of a sudden I could just get from point A to point B without getting lost because Google Maps knows it. And so I, I'm used to listening to Google Maps directions. And about six months ago, her voice changed. It was, and other people noticed too. She became friendlier. She had more... <laughs> She's like, you know, some of us that don't have a lot of friends, we look for friends where we can. So Google, Google Maps lady is my friend. But she started, when, when, we, when I arrived, she'd say, you've arrived. And there was actually a little bit of a hint of happiness that I'd gotten there. Whereas in the past, before six months ago, it was, you've arrived. Like, just period. But now it's, you've arrived. <laughs> She's so warm. So while AI can't empathize right now, that's one thing that I think may change. And this is really scary because this goes right into the primitive parts of our brain. As Michael said, we're, we rely on stories. We're humans. We, we rely on emotional connections. When AI truly learns how to tap into that, that's, that's when we need to really be careful because we don't have the natural uh, responses to that. And there we go. AI can't innovate. It can't think of something new. And more importantly, AI can't tell you the so, what does this mean? That, it, when, I, when I tell people about the kind of work that I do, business research and that sort of thing, and, and people will sometimes say, well, uh, you know, how, that must be pretty easy. You just do a Google search and you send the results or something and, and you must be able to do the same results for five people because it's the same question. And no, no, it's every question is different because I'm asking what will you be doing with this information? What will you be doing next? What does this tell you? What does the lack of information tell you? We know how to do all that. Um, AI doesn't yet know how to talk about the what does this mean to you, to make that connection between the data that it knows in its little black box and the rest of the world out there in the real world. AI can't figure out the question behind the question. My, it's the, the most frustrating part, I think, is when we don't, when, when we're given a, a research project or a, a query, we're thinking about what, what does this really mean, whereas AI still is pretty, pretty literal, only knows what's really there. I think information professionals can stay two steps ahead of AI, if you're, if you're walking quickly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's by realizing what it can and what it can't do. 
We need to focus on what our expertise is, not necessarily the specific tasks that we do. Here's the thing. Information professionals find, evaluate, acquire, organize, analyze, distill, manage, share, and store information. That's what we've always done. That was what information professionals did 300 years ago, and that's what we, I suppose, will be doing in 300 years, although I don't know that for sure, so maybe I shouldn't say that. But the, the things that we're doing haven't changed all that much. The, well, what we do changed, but why we're doing it, the functions that we're responsible for, those haven't changed. It's just that we're using different tools in which to do them. We need to, or we can, serve as a guide or interpreter or uh, an, an introduction to AI, even if we're not involved in the development of it. A great example of that, a great example of that, is the University of Rhode Island, which is this, um, it's a small, Rhode Island is the smallest state in the United States, and the University of Rhode Island is a small university, although think big, we do, very clever. There, the library at the University of Rhode Island has built an AI lab. Now, the librarians there are not AI scientists, but they know that it's all about information. And so they have AI workstations using open access sources. They don't have a huge budget, but they're able to find there are open access AI algorithms out there, that, and they, they curate and collect data sets, open access data sets that the students can use. They host meetups of people within the university who are involved in AI to get them talking together, talking about resources, new tools, new insights, things that they can do. They, while they don't teach AI, they go through resources that are available, learning resources, and they have a whole portal of courses and, and short workshops that students can attend or take to learn more about AI. So they've really taken AI as a topic and said, even though you know, we're not AI computer scientists, we can gather the care about that together and make it, um, and make it richer for everyone. The challenge with AI is anticipating the impact of disruptive technology. And we're bad at that because we're humans. Remember when social media first came around and we called it Web 2.0? And I think about that now. We completely missed it. By calling it Web 2.0 as if it were just another web, but bigger or shinier or fresher, missed the point entirely. Social media is the opposite of the web. In the web is content that's created by the website owners. So you go somewhere to look at information. Social media, on the other hand, is all user generated. The platform is simply the infrastructure. The people are putting the content out there. All this to say, something as big as social media, we completely missed its impact when it first came out. Likewise, the Oxford English Dictionary, a great resource, was published in volumes, in many volumes, until the year 2000, when they realized there was this thing called the internet and all these online things. Most other publishers in the year 2000 were still doing print books, and that was what was considered you know, the standard, the, if it was really real, especially for something like a dictionary, this is an authoritative source. Oxford English Dictionary realized that their content was more than just the words on the page. It was the links between words. And by digitizing and then making those hyperlinks among all the contents, among all the entries, it became so much more powerful. The Oxford English Dictionary online is now one of the critical resources of English literature students in a way that it never was when it was in print. So this is, this is an example of an organization that saw a new technology and actually recognized the, the impact that it could have and what they could do with it. 
AI is already in information centers, although we don't realize it, just like AI is in our phone and it doesn't really look like it. There are tools already that enhance the discoverability of information. This is where it's more than just access, it's discoverability. But there are concerns that we have to address while we're bringing this kind of AI into, uh, into our organizations. And the first is deep learning that I mentioned before. When AI is making sense out of the world but can't explain to us what, how it's thinking, do we trust that? Do, are we comfortable trusting that? Maybe we have to, or maybe we should actually um, push for something else, advocate for what's called explainable AI. XAI, and this is developing AI systems that don't depend on this black box deep learning, but can explain to you, it may be very complicated, but can explain to you why I came to this conclusion. We don't, we don't have a lot of explainable AI now, but I think this is something that we in this room should be talking about within our organizations, about the importance of bringing in technology that explains itself to us so that we're not trusting a black box. We need to teach information literacy in a different way. Think about it. Every, maybe not in this room, but most people out there on the street, civilians, um, they trust Google because it's always right. Often people don't trust Wikipedia all that much because in Wikipedia, you can look and see the discussion. You can see the debate about the entry, what's, what's in that entry. People say, well, see, that's why you can't trust Wikipedia, because people have different opinions. But actually, that's transparent intelligence. You actually see why something is considered authoritative because you see the debate behind the scenes. Google, on the other hand, presents you with a result, doesn't tell you why, and we believe it. Messy looks unreliable to people, but messy, what we see in Wikipedia, is, is actually maybe more trustworthy. Another big issue is how we negotiate contract licenses with online contact. Information providers, online database hosts, are struggling to figure out how to make other information, their metadata, available for AI processing. And they haven't figured out how to license it or, um, or make it available to users. And we need it, and we have to have these discussions. Here's a, a challenge with dealing with online information, which I just sort of realized. A lot of people... Information is information. Whether it comes in a book, whether it comes in an ebook, whether it's open source, whether it's a licensed database, many people don't see that any of that is limited or restricted. It's all, if it's available online, it must be okay. The, the, um, <laughs> the acronym that has never taken off, and I don't understand why, IOTA Wolf, just trips off the tongue, stands for it's all on the web for free. You can see why it doesn't take off. This is what we're battling, is people assume whatever content they find online, whatever it is, it's probably, it's free to use and it's accessible. We need to build more awareness and curate resources that we can bring into an organization to bring more intelligence, to bring that big data in to increase in discoverability. And we also have to talk about whether this is something we have a license for or whether this is open access or not. How do we evaluate and acquire that open access content? There's a lot out there. I think it's important for information professionals to be responsible for bringing some of that content inside to curate open access sources that are useful for your organization. Leveraging our special collections and seeing what should be digitized and added to public information. Of course, digitizing content that you own yourself is an expense, and the question there is, do we have the money to digitize and then to add the metadata to make it useful? A lot of questions here. Um, <laughs> and I, I think what, what I'd like to sort of leave you with is there's 
information professionals need to be part of the AI conversation. Even though we're not computer scientists, many of us, we're not directly involved in AI. But AI is all about information, and it's based on information, and that's the part where we can play a difference, is to make sure that that AI is based on good, intelligent information and is unbiased, relevant, and timely. Uh, we also are responsible for managing the understanding of AI so that that trust that we humans are wired for isn't too trusting of what appears to be intelligent but may not be. And that's it. I will take quite, and I apologize for being a little longer than I had hoped to be. Can I take any questions before our break? Okay. Thank you. <laughs>